All right, friends, welcome to a new episode of 12 Week Relationships. This time I have a very special guest, Matthias Barker. And Matthias, you have been patiently waiting for us to deal with technical issues. You had some on your side. I was originally late. We've 40 minutes. We're finally here and uh, I couldn't be more stoked. So thank you for joining us. Hey, I'm happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. Likewise. So for those that that may not know, I would imagine most of our audience does know who you are. Um, but if in case you don't, Matthias, you have a huge following on on TikTok, a massive following on Instagram. Last time I checked, you're in the millions on TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, does, yeah. 2.5. 2.5. Does that time. kind of blow your mind a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's it's pretty hard to like mentally hold a number like that. It's um yeah, I think as, as numbers have grown, it's just kind of impressed the importance of making sure I'm doing my homework and I'm really saying something substantive and that's going to help. And I think the more all that has kind of expanded, it's just been like pressing me further and further in of like, oh, okay, I really, I really want to make sure like what I'm bringing to people, what I'm, what I'm saying online isn't just casual. It's not, um, flippant. Like I really want to make sure it's, it's substantive. I think it's, it's been challenging in this like mental health world where, you know, cause I'm a licensed therapist, there's, there's a different kind of weight to, to the things that I'm saying or the advice mm-hmm. I'm giving out. So I just want to be a good steward of it, I guess. And so, um, at the beginning I, I, it was like blogging and I don't know, like my mom and, and my wife were liking the posts. And so there's a little bit of experiential, just kind of like, Oh, you know, combining ideas together in new fresh ways and kind of just having fun. And, and now that it's kind of been expanding, I'm like, Oh, okay. I really want to make sure that this is, um, yeah, I just felt, I guess, a weight of responsibility is a long way of saying that. You are very good at it. I mean, I, I know probably, I know exactly what you're saying in, in the sense of like, uh, most of your videos are between, you know, 30 seconds to, and, and same with ours, like 30 seconds, 90 seconds. And, and it's really difficult to convey knowledge, nuance, relatability, all those things within such a short period. Um, for it to be helpful and and especially when we're talking about subjects that you honestly want to say i, I feel like the answer to every question is well it depends <laughs> it depends yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah. you're very yeah. good at it and uh honestly it's been very inspirational just to watch like how you do it and i, I remember reaching out to you kind of early on in our process of like 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 what you're doing from from the people that know the field regardless of where you're at you know you're a psychotherapist you know, you have knowledgeable coaches, you have different arenas, but when I see your videos, I could, I could instantly tell that like, this was, this was different. Um, there's very few people that understand and get it, but then can also convey it in that way. And so makes it very special. Wow, thank you. Um, oh, that's kind of to say, thank you. Yeah. So I thought it'd be fun topic to bring you on and, uh, I'm hoping that this will be the first of many appearances that we have you on our podcast, but, uh, the future one's not, not <laughs> yeah, having yeah. technical issues. <laughs> Um, no, it's great. Yeah, happy to be here. But mm. I, I thought it'd be fun to talk about that, your ability to bring relatability and knowledge mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all those things to to just the way that you speak in general, because I think it's not only helpful from, uh, you know, obviously if, if we have listeners that are therapists, psychotherapists, coaches, it's, it's very useful and helpful on that side or just on the creator side who people would want to educate, but also on the side of like mm. in general you know, in any relationship, being able to convey a message while being relatable to the person that you're speaking with. Um, you're a master at this. And I thought, oh, I want to hear it from the master. Like how, yeah. how, what do you think about when you're creating these videos? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think you summarized it really well because there's so much context dependence on something like, I don't know, take a topic like cheating or a topic like um, working through conflict with your partner it's like the first thing that comes to mind is like, well, okay, well, what's the context? Like, what are the pieces that we're playing with? And it's really a challenge to kind of derive these overarching principles that have like general applicability um, mm-hmm. to a large amount of people. It's, it's hard to kind of distill down like what is functionally happening regardless of maybe the components that are at play. So for example, like I, what it, what is in common between someone arguing about the trash, someone arguing about in-laws, someone arguing about... Um, what side of the bed to sleep on or what kind of lamps that you should buy for the bedside mm-hmm. table. Like mm-hmm. all these different, almost like mundane, just kind of normal things that we get in these tufts about. Like what is in common between them? Yeah. And then even the big things, you know, and I think one of the big aha moments I had after 
studying the Gottman model, which is a kind of a whole philosophy of couples counseling in psychotherapy, was even the big stuff actually followed a lot of those same patterns. You know, so even when you're arguing about like how to discipline the kids or, you know, what to do about huge financial decisions or the dream that you have to to move closer to your family and your partner wants to take a job really far away, it's like, you know, that feels like a lot bigger deal than just the trash or leaving the garage door open or, you know, if you put your shoes away. But the style in which we have those conversations actually have tons of overlap. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not so much trying to figure out who's right. Like one of the stats that the Gottmans kind of put out right at the beginning was was like 68% of arguments are unresolvable. Like they're just a mm-hmm. result of personality differences and differences in experience in the ways that you see the world. So the question isn't really who's right because there's there's a lot of right ways to do things. There's a lot of right ways to keep your shoes either in the entryway or in a closet or stacked on a shelf. Like, like one of those isn't right. It's just there, what's though? right for you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. Well, the wrong way would be right in the entry where I trip over them. Yeah, yeah okay, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but there's a, a lot of overlap, I guess. And so that's what then pushed me into thinking, okay, what if I could functionally get at the style in which people are having conflicts the yeah. style in which we're relating to each other. Um, and that, so that's like in a couple's world. And a really a lot of the psychotherapies I started to kind of gravitate towards kind of had this almost, um, I mean, it's a bit behavioral, to be honest. It would be the right adjective for it. It's a behavioral mindset. So it's like, what mm-hmm. if there's a style of acting in the world or a style of relating to certain topics or domains of life or tragedies or, or catastrophes in life that that if you just changed your style of interacting with them, then kind of regardless of the context, you're going to have a better result. And that felt like something I could make generally applicable. And so I kind of went on like this deep kind of analytical journey of trying to understand the relations between um, things that matter to us. And that sounds really abstract. It sounds kind of strange. But so I started studying something called relational frame theory, Hmm. um, which is kind of in the, the field of something called contextual behaviorism. And so I went and studied a bunch of long um, textbooks with a bunch of jargon and insider language that no one really knows how to understand Mm -hmm. unless you read all the textbooks. And then I paid lots of money (laughs) to uh, consult with experts that really inspired me and I thought really kind of had their heads wrapped around the model and tried to get it. And then my process was, okay, how do I present this to someone who is a layman who has no interest in studying psychology, has no interest in pop psychology or becoming a therapist. Like, how can I just make this completely sure. normal? Mm-hmm. And that was a really heavy task of, and, and the thing that kind of guided that was like, well, I, I believe it's true. Yeah. I believe that there's a truth here and there's a, there's, and this truth is applicable. It's not just interesting. It's like, it's relevant. It changes the way I interact with the world. It changes the way I connect to the stuff that's most meaningful to me. And so um, the way that I kind of zeroed in on that was was trying to construct metaphors that I thought were really powerful. And and that was kind of what I zeroed in on was what if I could do it through story? Because I think stories change the way we relate to things. Yeah. And so most of my talks, I mean, there's exceptions, but most of my talks that are in 30 seconds have to do with sharing a metaphor that changes the way that you relate to something. There's a, ch- there's a change that happens within the metaphor, and then you can apply that change to things in your life. Yeah. And um, that was kind of my strategy going in. It was kind of a hypothesis. I'm like, I wonder if this could work if I got that almost mechanistic with it. If I was like, because I would like graph out these talks and like think through the the kind of functional change that I wanted to make with something. And and this feels all super over the top and like really heady. But but I just I don't know. I was really fascinated with it, and I thought it could work. And and the goal is not to keep it heady, was actually to distill it down into a place that was super just normal sounding, that a teenager could hear it and just feel like, oh, that makes sense. So I did that, and and then it kind of blew up and, and did really well. And that was kind of exciting. That was just fun to go in with a hypothesis and to see it kind of manifest like that. Um, you yeah. know, so, for example, like, because this all maybe sounds a little abstract, I'll give you just like a tangible example yeah, of it. of course. Like, um, you know, so... <clears throat> So something like, we'll stick even with the Gottman model. So something that the Gottmans found out just through studies was, was there was like, um, I don't know, there was, there was a style of conflict um, that they called turning away, Mm -hmm. which is in response to how people respond to something called bids. And so their 
definitions of that insider language just means you're trying to get your partner's attention. You're trying to, you know, show them something that you find interesting or that just, uh, I don't know, piques your curiosity, something normal. Like, oh, there's a plane outside. Oh, look at that plane. It's really low to the mm-hmm. ground. Isn't that crazy? You know, so something totally innocuous, normal. <clears throat> and, uh, and your partner had a few different ways that they could respond to that. They could ignore you. They could, uh, they could go, oh, nice. Oh, cool. Uh, plane. You know, or they could uh, they could look out the window, or they can get really frustrated towards you. They could just be like, "Oh my gosh, stop interrupting me! Don't you see that I'm reading?" Or they could they could go, "Ugh," you know, and and just like sigh really loudly, and then go over and look at the window and be like, "Okay, you happy? I looked at your stupid point." Yeah. You know, so turning away all these versus turning styles. toward. Exactly. Yeah. This that's the turning away, the turning towards, the turning against, and um, and then what that results in is you just stop trying to get a hold of your partner. Mm-hmm. You just stop trying to show them things. And that's what it trains. If you're going to respond all negatively to your partner like that, it just means that they're going to stop trying to get your attention and show them things that are interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> and so this actually can bleed into the, you know, not just interesting, curious things, but also into like, I don't know, domains where you feel a little frustrated. You feel frustrated that they left their shoes on the carpet right in front of their house if you, or, or in front of the house. You feel frustrated they left the garage door open, that they left the trash you know, and, and we're just stacking, you know, little things on top of each other, you know, instead of actually taking the bag and bringing it out so that, you know, the whole thing collapses if you were to put another, like, you know, to-go tin in there or something. So you're frustrated. <clears throat> and you also learn that if I bring up frustrations with them, they also bite back at me. They also get really frustrated. Mm-hmm. They also just turn against or they turn away, you know. And so then what I do is I just ignore it. And that's actually one of the worst things you can do is just ignore that dynamic because then it builds up and builds up and builds up over time and then you just get resentful. And that's that's functionally what we're talking about when we see people like falling out of love with someone. You know, when it says, oh, we yeah. were really connected in the beginning and then we fell out of love seven, eight years or after kids or after the illness or after the we went bankrupt or whatever. It's it's actually functionally just those little tiny things. Mm-hmm. And so then, so I'm reading all that data and that research, and that's kind of complex to try to fit into 45 seconds. And so I'm like, well, what, what's a metaphor that would communicate that? And so then, like one metaphor that I built for that was like, sometimes when you're really frustrated and you just kind of push it off, it's kind of like using an emotional credit card. Hmm. And you just kind of let the frustration stack up and you think like, oh, okay, I'll just push this off till later. It's not really worth bringing up or it's not really going to work. And then one day you like, you get the bill in the mail and it's like, you have all this debt. And that debt looks like feeling cold, feeling like you fell out of love, feeling like they don't really understand you, feeling completely unappreciated. And and then I'm like, so maybe, I don't know, I don't remember how he summed up that video, but some sort of call to action to kind of take those small things seriously. And so what's, you know, in my mind, I spent a good several hours combing over research, thinking through all that different stuff to build just that one metaphor. But sure. it's informed by chapters and chapters and chapters of reading on, on bids. Yeah. And so I, I can feel confident that that's not just like a nifty idea that I have, but that's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot underneath it. It's, it's dense, I guess, is yeah. the point. There's and, a lot of substance to, to each of them. I'm trying to, yeah, I guess I'm trying. And then, um, and then the metaphor is cool because, well, there's a lot of depth in story and in metaphor and in the relation to a credit card. And you can kind of import all those anxieties and all that avoidance and all of the complicated emotions that come with credit card debt but into your relationship with your partner and it's like it makes sense immediately and i just communicated you know a whole context but in just one image um i guess i'm really over answering this question but you asked like how i do it that, that, that that's what i think no because that's I just go into that level of detail i i don't know if you realize i mean you're a, you're a very humble and down-to-earth person so i don't i don't think that you would recognize that but it is an incredibly special thing that you can do that um i even had a conversation with dr glenn and i asked i asked dr glenn at one point and i was like i I, what you do i would say that i have learned over a course of like 10 years just teaching like educating in general but my experience was more so in in photography and creativity and business in different areas and i i would try to simplify things down and and even even now like i would say that i'm pretty good at it but when i see yours i'm like Okay. There are, there are levels to this. And like when I see your metaphors, I'm like, okay, I still have, I have plenty of, of, of additional work that I need to put into this. But I even went to Dr. Glenn at one point. I go, I go, 
Glenn, is there a place where like Matthias is getting his metaphors? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> is there is there a book that like you guys were given or something? Or and he's like, I mean, a lot of the stuff he's like, it comes from these different things. And so I specifically wanted to ask yeah, yeah. you on the podcast. I was like, are you actually yep. coming up with them or uh, some of them? There's actually what's what's cool is when you dive into um, so contextual behavior science actually has like books of metaphors that they yeah, use to yeah. to kind of like create different transitions. So there's one called um, the Big Book of Metaphors or the Big Book of Act Metaphors. Um, so what's cool is I actually saw Dr. Julie Smith. I don't know if you know who yeah. she is. She's a big yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Um, Julie's psychologist awesome. on TikTok world. She, she's gotten the same book because we both gave our own videos using those metaphors and then cited it. That's hilarious. You know, so we weren't being sneaky about it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it was just like, oh, cool. You used chapter seven and that's how you used chapter seven or that's how you kind of made the video about that metaphor. Here was yeah. my take on chapter seven. And it, we didn't even know that we both had read that book and so that was just funny um and so there's a few of those yeah i just think uh, maybe another side of it and this is i think to your credit pi is like you're really good at this i think that you're better than honestly most people at this is you got to not just communicate it in like this heady analytical sciencey way but you got to communicate it with warmth and you got to be like a human being on the camera and i think that people are looking to see if you're trustworthy and they're looking into your eyes they're looking like at your face to see if like you actually care about them or if you're just here to sell them something or if you're here to pat your own ego or or if you're there to get some sort of affirmation that you're like a wise good guy that knows what he's talking about like all of us come to this world of trying to kind of put our advice or our world philosophies on the internet for different reasons sure. and some of them are more altruistic or some of them are more you know uh counter transference focused than than others yeah and so there's a a genuineness i guess is what i'm saying um, communicated through just the body language and your voice and your vocal tones and in your eyes that you either have or you don't. Um, and I think that you have it. I think that's something that really drew me to your work. And I'm like, oh man, this guy feels warm. He feels genuine. He feels grounded. He's sharing advice with a bit of vulnerability. Like there's been times that you've really talked about your past or even um, the lessons that you've learned through your own relationships. And, and I think that that honesty, that's really what it is. It's honesty. Yeah. Is yeah. kind of what builds that rapport. No one cares what you think unless they think you care. Sure. Um, and so I could be in my office diagramming metaphors all day, but no one gives a rip if if they don't know that I care about them and that I'm doing it for them. I'm not doing them to look smart or I'm not doing it to look this or that or to get followers, but I'm doing it because I care about them. Like I just think that stuff is obvious. You can smell it on somebody. No, I, um, I, I that's, very that's much a whole appreciate that. Dynamic. I, I appreciate yeah, so I that. And, that um, you know, so if I were to sum up, I, I'm a, I'm a framers person. So I love to kind of like distill things down yeah, into yeah. what they are. And yeah. so I would kind of take, I, I love your first piece. Cause it's, I feel like what's missing in a lot of educators and, and creators is you took the time to analyze. I mean, that, that oftentimes is what's missing just, just to start, right? Like they, they don't necessarily <laughs> have the background or the knowledge to, to do something, but yeah. you take the time to analyze a concept um, and I think with that original concept, you can only relate to a certain number of people, right? When you take something that's like behavioral science, cognitive, you know, therapy, whatever it might be, it's, it's applicable and it's interesting to people that are actually going to study it, right? To the psychologists, the yep. therapists, coaches, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so you take this concept that has sort of a, a narrow audience. And then I think once you understand it enough, um, the very unique part about that is, is like you said, your metaphors. And and having done education for a while, that's that's what I wanted to you know say is like they're they're very special. Like the way that you're distilling things mm -hmm. down to these metaphors, you're basically taking those concepts and and instead of dialing it into a narrowed audience, you're taking it and you're opening up. So like that the way that you're presenting, even when you present, um, you know, a lot of times you start your videos and you say maybe you're dealing with this or it could mm. be this and then you go right into the metaphor that relates it so you kind of give people two two or three different places to think of like where this is affecting them then you go into a metaphor that's easily bring the concepts together and making it understandable and i think that's what makes it very special in in the way that you open up the the audience you take something that's kind of niche and you open up to a, a broad audience the second piece of this framework, which you just touched on, is the the authenticity, the way that you're speaking to somebody. Um, and I'll tell you this from from being on my side. I, I I didn't, you know, 
learn how to properly teach, I would say. Like I just kind of, I just tried to start teaching uh, 10 years ago when I was, we were opening up our photography studio and I found that I was, I was saying the same thing to people over and over. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to make videos on this kind of stuff. And, and then those videos mm. took off and that was our very first foray into kind of broad education and doing that kind of stuff. But I'll tell you that the thing that was most challenging to me at the beginning was being okay with being wrong, being okay with not knowing everything. Um, and I would, if I go back and I watch those videos, you know, 12, 13 years ago, they're very cringy because I'm trying to force my, um, I guess my, my knowledge on this. It, it feels like I'm trying to force a level of uh, authority that, that you mm. can tell that I really don't have, and I'm not comfortable with like, so I'm, I'm trying to do it in a way of like, this is what you should do. And this is, you know, so I, I feel like the second piece of this framework is in your relatability is not only being authentic, but then also being okay with understanding your own limitation, being okay with being wrong, mm -hmm. being okay with, you know, people disagreeing. And again, when I watch one of your videos, I go, he knows what he's talking about, but somehow in the way that he's speaking, he's so open with it's okay if this doesn't apply to you. It's okay if this isn't, you know, right for you. It's, and I didn't know how, is that a process that you learn formally? Is that something that, have you always been naturally, you know, good at speaking with people and communicating this way? Wow. Well, I mean, I'm so happy it, it gives that um, impression. Because, I mean, I think one of the things that I did almost like in a, um, I don't know, in, in the actual, like, talking part of the video. So like when I sit down to film and I, I, I type everything out right and, and I don't want it to sound like it's typed out because I'm not trying to recite a monologue really. I'm, so there's almost kind of a performative act aspect to it because I'm, I'm saying it for the camera. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted it to feel conversational like we're sitting down and we're having a conversation almost kind of like you're in the therapy chair with me or, um, or we're sitting down as friends and, and not like you're here at a lecture. It feels like, an like right now, it, that. your videos feel yeah. like you right now. Yeah, I want, well, I, I'm so glad because that's really what I want. And and there's this, there's this casualness to the body language, even though there's not casualness in the things that I'm saying mm -hmm. that I try to incorporate. Um, I, I leave in some of the mistakes or some of the pauses or if, sometimes I'm looking for the right word and I'll, I'll leave that in there. Um, I don't know. I, I think that all just goes to like, making sure that it feels human and not too perfectionistic and polished. It's like, mm -hmm. and I think that's a little challenging because I, you and I are similar where we have like a good lighting setup. We, we do the camera work really well. We make sure to kind of make sure, you know, fire on all cylinders on that point. But it's, um, I guess, I guess the two dynamics that I'm kind of zeroing in on on that front is one, I'm, people can tell when you're being perfectionistic and that you're trying to, talk yourself out of a criticism that you hold for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, people can tell if you're trying to compensate, I guess is one way of putting it. Yeah. And the, the real like energy that you're bringing to the room is going to come across even in, even in the things that you're preparing. And I think sometimes the times that we're trying to be the most strategic is when people can smell it on us the most. Mm -hmm. And so my just genuine feelings about the matter is I've researched this as, you know, as thoroughly um, as I feel like is reasonable. And, and then I have this idea and it's an idea that I'm still playing with and I'm still learning and I have this metaphor that I think could be helpful and, and let's try this out. Let's, let's put this into the public and to the wild and I'll read the comments and I'll see if it landed or not. And, and there's some acceptance that sometimes people are, are going to misunderstand or it's not going to be relevant or some of the videos I say I don't really land because they're not that good and it wasn't a very thoughtful um, presentation of that idea and and that openness is what I hope comes across um, but there's also times I don't know where it's not that noble and valiant where I am a little bit nervous and I'm putting out an idea that it's not that it's half-baked but that I'm just I'm just curious about it. I'm just still learning about it mm -hmm. and and so there, there that feels a little bit extra vulnerable and then to be honest I'm a little anxious and and when I'm putting it out um, so I guess it's it's not always from just like this grounded place where I kind of communicate all that openness and freedom. Some of it some of it is from that place emotionally, and then other times it feels 
I don't know, like I'm, I'm learning like everyone else and fallible like everyone else. And especially when I'm touching on topics that are deeply, deeply personal, I'm just like, man, I really hope this doesn't like make things worse. Like I, I think yeah, being a trauma therapist, I know that even advice that's well-intentioned, if it's put into the wrong context or given to someone at the wrong time, it can actually have a bad effect. And for example, inviting someone into reflecting on your mother and mm. and thinking about your mom and exploring some of those emotions. Some people are just in a place where they're just so triggered and it's just such a tender moment in, in this time of life with mom that it would be totally overwhelming and triggering um, to reflect on mom. And so how do I how do I navigate some deeply personal spaces in a way that keeps people safe? That's something that kind of keeps me up at night and I'm really trying to do wisely. Um, and I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but those are all the thoughts that kind of surround that question, I guess. <laughs> it's like, yeah. uh, there's times, there's times I feel like really grounded and, and like, Oh yeah, this is, this is going to be a great idea. I'm excited to share it. I have a lot of openness. I feel just kind of a, a lot of acceptance for it. Other times I feel more anxious. I feel nervous. I'm learning still. So it feels like, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's almost like posting it is an act of learning as well, just to see how people take it. And then, um, and then other times where I'm like, okay, this is wading into really personal territory. I'm worried that I'm worried. I'm just worried for people that it might just be in a place where this is too much. And, and even putting a trigger warning on the front of the page isn't necessarily going to stop them from watching the video yeah and so and then i just got to trust people i just got to lean in and trust that people are going to be have to pay attention to their own capacities and if you know a topic that i bring up like reflecting on mom is too much i just got to trust them to keep scrolling yeah. or to be able to regulate and reach out to their support systems if they feel like they touch some really personal places so i oftentimes when when up. filming something think the same thing i kind of have to mm -hmm trust a person to say this is right for me this is not right for me even though yeah, you know from experience yeah. you also know that there's there's a lot of people that that maybe don't have that um they haven't trained that ability yet so they are willing to grasp onto things and take things maybe before they've thought them through by the way i think i think mm -hmm. a tail i keep seeing a tail pop up is that your cat in the back yeah yeah my cat <laughs> jumped up on my lap right That's here so, so cute oh. you're seeing if you hear some purrs in the background it's my cat pepper i was so irritated pepper um was uh, I have a photo background behind me, and okay. it's a it's a new cloth one that I just got. And yeah. Pepper kept playing with the cloth background at my last Q and A, and the whole time, like I didn't notice this because I'm talking, but the background is just fluttering, and and she almost <laughs> knocked, like pulled it down, and I'm just like, oh gosh, so unprofessional. My, uh, it's, it's kind of my adorable. cat. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I hope people take it that way. I hope people feel it's endearing. But it, yeah, this. So this I guess down here with me. you know on on those notes of like the body language the openness and communication the yeah yeah um I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you like i i'm a person that i feel like in every area of my career all the businesses that i've built have been around kind of resolving my own personal issues like like literally mm -hmm. one after another has just been kind of figuring things out for myself and and um i would say that you know photography one of the reasons that that drew me to that over a decade ago was I always thought I was creative, but I was always told that I wasn't. And so this as a, as a field was like so interesting to me. And then I wondered, um, I'd learned enough at that point to kind of be like, okay, I think, I think anything can be learned so long as you, uh, you know, apply a process to it. So I thought maybe I could apply a process to creativity. Um, and then wedding photography drew me in because it was like for 15 years, this was this thing that I'd been wanting so much in my own marriage and I never had. So then mm. the first time I photographed a wedding and, and I only know this stuff now that I can actually like look back through like a, you know, uh, a, a little bit of a psychology lens, you know, on this whole thing. Sure, sure. But um, when I photographed my first wedding, there was something about seeing that love that I, I, I just, I wanted for myself. And so I had this love affair with wedding photography where every weekend I would go out and photograph weddings and I would feel the high and then come home realizing that's not mm. what I have. Um, mm. But all the pieces of education, the systems, everything that I've built has been kind of to fix things that I personally have needed. You know, how do I sell something? Well, how do I learn photography? Then how do I light? Then how do I pose people? And so I developed these different systems and approaches to each one just for myself. And then other people found them useful. 
Um, and then that went on to the business side of photography and sales. And, you know, there's a lot of psychology built into my, my sales programs because I love psychology. That's been something I've studied for a very long time, um, just informally. Yeah, yeah. And uh, coming back to, it, it was like six years ago, seven years ago, when I started to really challenge my each of my, every person that wanted to give me any sort of relationship advice, um, whether it was professional, whether it was someone that I just, and it was maybe a little bit even confrontational, but to my my therapist, to my counselor, I would say like, can you just tell me what does a healthy relationship look like? I mean, I, I don't even care what kind of relationship, just a, a friendship, a, a family relationship, a, a marriage, anything. Tell me what a healthy relationship, and none of them. And, and I got to the place where Matthias, I'd eventually asked over 30 people that question and professionals. None of them could give me an answer that wasn't really any better than like the basic advice that you might hear. Like, well, it's about compromise. Well, it's about, you know, communication. Well, it's about, mm. but I'd learned enough at that point to start challenging it. I'm like, well, it can't be all about communication, like, because it's important, mm -hmm. but that's one piece of a, of a big puzzle. You can't say that we minus out intimacy, minus out, you know, the ability to be able to connect just because we're good at talking about things doesn't mean that it's going to work out. Right. Um, yeah. so I started challenging those things and I realized that when I started writing the book, it was once again, I was writing something for myself. It was like, mm -hmm. I need to understand what does a healthy, any relationship look like? And then from that place, it began turning into something more. It was a five-year process that led, led, like it led to the finishing of the book and then eventually with Dr. Glenn and, and creating the platform and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. but I guess all of this is to say that all of these have been, Growing up, I, I these are just basic tools that I never had. You know how to be creative, how to develop a, you know, a business. How to how do you market? How do you create just good friendships? And how do you create healthy, romantic relationships? And so I always felt like I never had these tools that were so important and critical. And I'm curious on this side of your ability to communicate, your understanding of body language, the way that you maintain knowledge while being relatable. What if I were to say what percentage of this would you say has been learned versus like mm -hmm. environmental, like that you kind of grew up in a home that encouraged it. And yeah. So you're, you're talking about the communication style and my, yeah, my the way that you, my communication style, the way that you communicate the openness, the like, just right now, the way that you are, it, cause mm -hmm. this is what's so fascinating <laughs> to me is that the way that you are right now, um, I would say that it took me a decade just to be able to communicate in a way that was, non-confrontational -conf i don't have to be a know-it-all i can be open i can be wrong i can be i can just be me it took me a, 10 years to mm -hmm. get that and i know you haven't been doing this for 10 years yet because you're young <laughs> like I'm, I'm old you're young <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah so i'm just so curious like mm -hmm. what aspect of that was yeah learned versus like kind of environmental well, i think so there's a few things pop in my mind in, in trying to answer that would be something this, I think I don't know if it comes across this way, but I'm I'm pretty extroverted in personality type, okay. and then I'm also um, on a personality profile. I'm I'm pretty high in something called trade openness, which is uh, yeah um, includes things like creativity, uh, includes things like intellectualism, um, and like you know reading philosophy books and, and mm -hmm. being interested by the mechanisms of how everything fits together, um, and. I, specifically that interest being geared towards trying to change things and innovate things and seeing if things can be put in different combinations. And so I think what I've learned about myself just through studying psychology is like I'm very excited and enthusiastic. So that's an aspect of extroversion. And then um, I'm also creative and like putting things in new combinations and in new ways. And so some of the other sides of my personality spectrum that i trip me up more and kind of, I kind of are more troublesome is I'm not super organized. I'm not, I'm not a very tidy person. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know, I, I want to follow through and, and, you know, do everything, but sometimes I bite off more than I can chew and, and I get a little idealistic and, and all those kinds of things. And so as far as like communication style, I was always really from a young kid able to kind of rally people around an idea and get really excited about stuff that that was just kind of my charisma, I suppose is like, I'm deeply enthusiastic, really extroverted and social, and I just want everyone to get as excited about the thing I'm pumped about as everyone else. Yeah. And I have all these new, fresh ideas of how to do it that that for other open people are really excited. But for the conscientious types, um, 
the people who are more orderly, the people who, you know, feel more safe in the way things have done or more kind of uh, conventional or traditional, I I was just red flags all over the place. <laughs> you know, they were like, ah, he seems like he just wants to get in here and mess everything up. And and uh, I think for the introverted types and and I don't know, my enthusiasm was suspicious. It was just like, okay, you seem like this happy puppy dog all the time, you know, with everything mm-hmm. like where's your dark side? Like you mm. got, you have a dark side somewhere and I don't trust it. You seem a little cartoonish, I guess. <laughs> um, and, and so what was interesting was I think going into my twenties, uh, people are down to kind of, you know, get excited about your enthusiasm when you're 16, 17, 18. Cause I don't know, you're just full of potential and you're, it's kind of charming on an 18 year old. And then you're in your twenties and that just seems naive Mm -hmm. um and like you because you're overcritical about the way everything should be done and you have new ideas for how things can be constructed and organized and and so for example like i was pretty active like in my church and and i was on staff as a youth leader and i had all these different ways of doing things and wanted to create these different programs and projects and and i was constantly butting heads with my supervisors because i wanted to change everything and i was pretty disorganized and i wouldn't follow through on deadlines but when I really did pull something together, it was a smash hit. Like, yeah, it was um, it was really fun, and so people kind of took that as as immature and um, undependable and kind of f- uh, flaky and flighty. And they weren't wrong. Like, because that's that was probably tr- that, it was true. It was true mm-hmm. in, in my early twenties <laughs> that I was all those things because it was kind of this undeveloped, enthusiastic puppy dog of a kid with a bunch of creative ideas. And then I think my arc of maturity has been trying to actually ground myself in routines and in habits that um, allow me to follow through on the big ideas and then to distinguish which ideas I actually need to calm down and and um, and sit on and kind of cook for a little bit longer, you know, sure. because and then another aspect was actually how to um, be choosy of where to put my enthusiasm and to not you know, necessarily assume that just because I'm as enthusiastic about this idea, everyone else will too. And to give some credit and some uh, respect to the way things have been done and to, uh, to be a bit more patient before I try to rip something apart and reorganize it, but to be like, mm-hmm. hey, it probably took a lot of work to build this thing. And so I should have some respect for it. And so then what that's turned into is me being far less cynical of things like academics and, um, tradition and I like for example like on a faith level I read a lot of church history now when that wasn't interesting to me before Mm. Um, I read a lot of the old dudes reflecting on this faith that I've had you know that people have been thinking about for thousands of years and and then on a psychological level like I'm enthusiastic about old ideas now and I'm trying to be hesitant before I put them in new you know orders and, and break them up and try to combine them in different ways just trying to have some epistemic humility there and I think maybe something that comes across in the videos is is I have kind of this warm, extroverted, enthusiastic kind of thing that just wants to bring you along on the exciting thing that I'm doing. Yeah, and um, that's that's kind of a part of myself that I let you know kind of have free reign on the camera. You know, it's mm-hmm. like okay, this is your spot. This is a great context for you. Yeah, like, go ahead shine. and just get his. <laughs> yeah, this is your place to shine. But if you were my client in therapy, you'd actually get a lot more of a quiet version of me interesting um, that's actually a lot more hesitant to just start going on a rampage and start talking about all my ideas and everything that i'm excited about but uh, you would notice i'd probably talk 10 percent of the time mm-hmm. if, if we were in a client session that would make sense and that, but it would that be was hard actually to picture, really though. challenging <laughs> yeah well and and i'm not as like happy-go-lucky because i don't know people are coming in with the worst tragedies in life troubles that they've that they don't know how to figure out and so they're coming in and talking about incredibly troublesome things and like i specialize in working with sexual abuse for example yeah. and so most of my days are talking about horrific cases of sexual abuse and helping people recover from their trauma so it's actually a deeply somber mm-hmm. um, context and and so i actually have tried to flex my personality and and let myself be in a very patient calm and then i also lean into a lot of very traditional um modalities of psychotherapy and i i don't i'm I'm very slow to just throw out an idea that occurs to me spontaneously that i think is creative like i almost Mm -hmm. lean into the traditional i lean into the like evidence-based the 
tried and true because I want to make sure my people are okay. And, and so it's, um, I think I was really judgmental and critical of myself for having all these different parts to me and, and seeing a lot of that enthusiasm and extroversion as a weakness because I wasn't as organized or as industrious as I wish I was. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really quick to call myself lazy and flaky and, and, um, when I could kind of just do a lot of self work and therapy and study, when I kind of was able to enjoy the full roundedness of, of maybe the experiences that have formed who I am. Yeah. Um, then I was able to kind of let myself be what I need to be in each moment and, and took a lot of enjoyment and, and, uh, it felt free. It felt flexible, I guess is what I'm saying. And yeah. so, um, the communication style, that you see on a camera is, is going to be very enthusiastic and warm and extroverted. That's a very normal part of me. It's almost kind of a, a playful like side of me that almost comes across a little bit young. Um, and then if you were, I don't know, to get with me and we were going to analyze something, I would get really heady and abstract and mm-hmm. a little confusing and, and we'd, to get all analytical together. That's a very genuine part of me. And then if we were in a counseling session, I would actually be fairly quiet and defer to you and I would reflect a lot and and not feel any pressure to have all the answers. Um, and just uh, to hold the complexity and the uncertainty with everything. And I would be really methodical. I'd be really methodical through, like my counseling style would feel very similar to another internal family systems therapist or another mm-hmm. Gottman therapist. Um, I follow the code pretty closely. And... Um, and if you were just my friend, if we were just barbecuing on my back porch, you'd probably get a combo of all those different parts and yeah. show up in different ways. And so I think that the people that I see to be the most dynamic on camera are the people who it's 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 deeper than just self-awareness. It's almost like an awareness of the multiplicity of you and the contexts mm-hmm. that you feel not just comfortable like letting loose in, but you almost give permission and you almost enjoy getting to see yourself flex in those different ways and different sorts of situations yeah. and um i don't know that that might be overly complex but that's that's how i think about it and so yeah the, the communication style is is as simple as just the extrovert in me i think being enthusiastic and having just a bunch of fun with new metaphors and ideas and um yeah it feels like um in watching the videos it feels like something that is naturally a part of you like you you kind of grew up with this level of which is very special in and of itself, whatever your family, your parents, like that, that environment was clearly a, a, and, and plus, you know, we also know that a lot of these things are genetic too. It's just nature and nurture Mm -hmm. kind of together, but it feels like that's naturally who you are, but it also feels like you're improving on it um, through the knowledge that you're gaining in, in psychology and through the various different studies. Like you're actually understanding the why behind the body language behind each thing. So you can, you can start to pick and choose, you know, which, Mm -hmm aspect you're going to use for different modalities of you know whatever it is speaking to someone at a barbecue versus an actual like you know therapy session um because you're right like like that extroverted self wouldn't be appropriate when you're talking about trauma and 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 deep-seated issues and whatnot um but it is very unique and it and it and very authentically you and i can also kind of see that your brother seems to have it too. Um, ben mm-hmm. seems very naturally. Yeah. I've only seen that one yeah. video of him doing the the cheese video. That was hilarious, and also very insightful, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love my brother Ben. We did um a whole series. It was like two years ago, I think, on um on sexual orientation and just his experience growing up gay, um in a kind of Christian context. And mm. uh, Ben has this similar dynamic range to him. Um, where he's just, especially me and him, I think me and him just relate on this goofy, you know, older little brother thing. Mm -hmm. And then we also have these deep intellectual conversations about philosophy and, and life. And then we also have just this bickering, irritable dynamic to our relationship where I just poke fun at him and just provoke him and antagonize him. And then he's like, stop, you know, like (laughs) there's, uh, all the good stuff that you have with a brother. Yeah. I think I'm really you know, blessed to have a father, I think, who really had a strong dynamic range in how he showed his emotions. Mm -hmm. And, and I think something that I've gleaned from my dad is, is a tremendous amount of empathy. He's a really empathetic person. He's really quick to try to see the story behind someone's actions, not to just kind of, um, write someone's actions off as good or bad or, 
um, he tries to kind of take that step in. Look for the and nuance. Then, um, yeah, look for the nuance. I think that was a consistent piece of advice I got from him was just you're, you're really quick to make a, an appraisal for, of good or bad on something. You got to kind of look at the nuance of it and look for the balance. And, and that was really great. And, and then a mother also who was just incredibly supportive and I think delighted in all the, the warm, extroverted, enthusiastic stuff. She just thought it was exciting too. And we would just play. I think me and my mom are very playful together. And so uh, that's a, it's a tremendous blessing. Not everyone has that. Not everyone yeah. has, um, and of course there's, there's aspects to my relationship with my parents that include hurt and wounds as well. But, um, mm-hmm. I think on the positive, it's, it's been really foundational for, I think of how I relate socially, whether that's on a camera or with anyone else is, um, that emotional attunement and that playfulness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're, you're attuned also to like one thing that you mentioned earlier, is not just being self-aware. It's also being kind of aware of the message that you're conveying yourself and conveying that message, but also the person that's receiving it. Right. And in, in the sense of mm-hmm. whether you're a therapist, whether you're an educator, it's, it's that ability to kind of empathize on the other side that I think is, is critically important. Right. And, and you have that. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, all this is to say that if you were to we've talked about this from the standpoint of, of creation or education, but if you could take the exact same process into any conversation that you want to have, whether it's with a coworker, whether it's a you know family member who you wish would do something differently, whether it's with a partner, you know, so many of the conversations that we have don't fall into kind of what we said. They don't come from a place of authenticity. They don't come from a place of being able to will, like recognize my part in it, but also be able to see your side. They don't come from that place of being okay if I'm wrong. Like it's okay if this isn't the way that you see things. Um, And so this, this ability that you have is when I, as, as soon as I saw it, I kind of felt like it's such a critical and important skill to have just as a person in general, not only as an educator, not only as a therapist, as a psychologist, but just as a person to be able to approach anyone, to be able to convey a message where you're not communicating in a way, regardless of, I, I feel like if you came to me and you said, if you had a problem with whatever it is that I did, um, and you brought it to me, just knowing you, I would accept it. I'd be like, you know what, Matthias, you're right. Because I wouldn't feel like I'm being, you would do it in a way where I wouldn't feel like I'm being attacked. I wouldn't feel like, you know, this isn't something that you don't do or that you don't, you know, have your own flaws. And, and that's a very interesting thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for saying that. I, I'm going to send you a big list of criticisms now. We'll see if that. that yeah. Just tell me out. everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, listen, here's all the stuff you got to change. No, I'm just joking. Um, There's yeah. a fourth side of me no, that you I haven't think, seen yet. <laughs> I think that's great. I, um, <laughs> I, I remember just the freedom of actually kind of learning something like personality models Yeah. in psychology. So I referenced like the big five that's, that was like the openness or the extroversion. Um, you know, so that, that was, that's calling back something called the big five personality model that helped me learn how to communicate in a really dynamic way to other people who weren't like me. And I think Mm. that was something that I think really lent to a lot of success just socially, not even just on Instagram or something, but just generally was Mm -hmm. when I could nail down, Oh, this person's an introvert and this person's conscientious. And so that means they relate to the world in a very different way than I do. Hmm. And when I could map out how they relate to the world, I knew how to persuade easier like because the way that for example you try to persuade someone who's conscientious isn't the same way you try to persuade someone who's um, open so someone who's open and creative you want to talk about all the bells and whistles and how exciting is and how this is going to change everything Mm -hmm. and allow you to do all the things that you wish you could ever do and you're going to talk about all the dreams and how exciting it is and how it's going to feel you're going to talk about the aesthetic you're going to talk Mm -hmm. about the uh you know everything that's going to feel inspiring but to a conscientious person that's just a bunch of red flags yeah. You got to talk about how this is actually going to take very little effort. It's going to be really efficient. You're not going to have to do a lot and it's going to make a subtle change that's going to make everything way more um, efficient and work better. And it's going to affirm the values and the, um, I don't know, the staple pillars of the thing they already have set up that they like. Mm-hmm. You know, like a lot of people don't understand that nuance. And so when you're talking to someone who's conscientious, which is most managers, by the way, most bosses and managers, that manage a lot of people are conscientious types and and then they're their supervisors the ceos and the entrepreneurs those are the open types and so they're driven crazy by their boss who's flaky and then so 
you know, and then they have employees like me, like when I was working at Guitar Center or something or Apple, I'm all oh, flighty and creative <laughs> and have all, all these ideas. And then my manager who's conscientious, he wouldn't, he didn't want to hear my ideas if I wanted to change everything. But if I yeah. could come along and say, hey, there's a subtle shift we could make that would make all this more efficient and would actually expand the thing that you already like in the system and, and make it shine brighter, then that's persuasive to a conscientious person. So I didn't, understanding that nuance, same thing goes for people who are really agreeable, people who are really like compassionate and empathetic versus people who are more disagreeable and competitive and um, blunt and just like things, just to, just say it how it is. They don't like beating around the bush. When you can start to understand those personality dynamics, you become a way more dynamic communicator. And mm. in the videos, what I do is I'll make a video and then I'll think through how a conscientious introvert, introverted person hear this video. How would an extroverted person like me hear this video? How would someone who's really neurotic or disagreeable, you know, interpret this video? And then that's, I think, what creates way larger reach, even just when you're trying to make something broadly applicable for people, is it's not just people that are like you that mm -hmm. vibe with your video. It's people who are really diverse, who are n nothing like you yeah. that vibe with it because you you considered them. It's like a version of listening. Mm -hmm. and that's how I think about it. It's like... I'm listening to you and I'm accounting for you as I'm trying to make a persuasive point um, when I'm building a metaphor or whatever. And I think that that has been something that's led to a lot of success in just communication more generally. So yeah. it's that awareness of the self and your own personality. I think that frees you up in a lot of ways. And it's also awareness of other people and the humility to be like, oh, this idea that I think is so powerful is probably only powerful for people like me. And... Um, and maybe there's people with totally different life experiences and personalities. And I got to sit and really think and reflect. And, and what's cool is you actually can do that. And then you can make a video that's really persuasive for people who aren't like you. And then they, they're excited to, um, I don't know, continue on the journey of whatever you're putting out in the world. And that's really rewarding. Yeah. So, I don't know. Well, yeah. the work you're doing is, is incredible, my friend. And I hope this is, I hope this is just one of many future conversations that we have, but, um, I thought this was a great little spot to kind of wrap this episode on. And uh, I'm going to actually re-listen to this episode myself because I feel like you've, you, uh, there was an entire framework in this for how do you relate to somebody regardless of the message that you're trying to communicate or the platform or method you're trying to communicate. It's really how do you get the message across without distractions, right? Distractions would be like, you know, getting someone upset or, or maybe not saying it um, in a appropriate manner or maybe leaving off important bits of information or whatever it might be. But that is such an important skill to have in any arena. And I, I, I want to go back and listen to this and even try and get it distilled down even further. So I appreciate you taking the time to share these yeah. insights and um, it's kind. you're writing your book right now. Well, we, we chatted that you're mm -hmm. supposed to be writing your book right now. <laughs> and then I'm um, supposed to be, <laughs> you're supposed to be. And then, uh, for right now, though, um, people can follow you, obviously, on Instagram, on TikTok, which we will link up if they're watching the video on YouTube. We'll link it up in the description. Um, but why don't you just mention all the different places in case they're just listening? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so Matthias J. Barker is kind of where you can find everything. That's M-A-T-T-H-I-A-S, J. Barker with a B. And um, yeah, I have a podcast, the Matthias J. Barker podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of on everywhere on social like Instagram or TikTok or whatever. And then um, I have a whole series of workshops that I do kind of for people who want to dive deeper into different topics around couples conflict or trauma or stuff like that. So I don't know, for a little something for everybody, kind of depending on where you're at. If you just want something quick, if you want to throw in a podcast on a car drive or something, or if you want to like do some deep work and actually kind of start to make some real improvements, I'm kind of trying to make something relevant for each person. So yeah, that's that's the stuff I'm up to. Thanks awesome. for having me. This is just... This is just amazing. And I've really enjoyed your work, Pi. I think that you have a really, like I said before, warm, but also I, I see a lot of these dynamics that we were talking about in the work that you've been doing that you just seem to be really pressing into to understand where lots of different kinds of people are coming from, to share advice that's generally applicable, that's inspired perhaps a lot by your personal experience, but that goes and extends far beyond that. And I think that you're you're going to not just like meet a lot of success, quote unquote, but I think you're just going to you're going to call out to a lot of different kinds of people who just are trying to make their relationships better and trying to move towards the people that they love. And I think you're doing a really good job helping. And I think that people are going to continue to, 
to join your caravan and and keep checking where you're going so i'm excited i'm excited to to watch you grow and to watch what you're doing thank you matthias well dr glenn and i he's not here but he thanks you as well and um yeah, yeah we we can't be i mean we're very grateful to be in this industry and have you know like leaders like you that that are very inspiring and honestly if anyone's listening and they're thinking about jumping onto your podcast onto your workshops your different seminars we can't recommend matthias's stuff enough so be sure to check him out give him a follow and uh i'm hopefully gonna be chatting with you again soon my friend so yes i'd like that too see you guys next time